Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and today's show is going to feature Sarah Breskman Cosme, a, a master QHHT practitioner and the author of the book, A Hypnotist Journey from the Trail to the Star People. Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. It is nominated by Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcast to listen to this year. It is high ranking under self-improvement and Apple podcasts nominated for two people's choice podcast awards and for a Webby award. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and access consciousness. They do great energy work out into the world and you can find out more at Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility specialist. I coach you how to write a book and take you from the inception, the idea of your book, to finished and published. I also have a company that takes an author's book to a guaranteed international best-selling status, and I do all the heavy lifting for the author. And finally, I teach you how to be interviewed on radio and podcast and how to get massive results so you can be your own publicist, because I also do that work. So it's time for all you spiritual messengers to learn how to do that yourself. You came here with a beautiful message and a light to be shown. And I'd love to teach you. I've got some free gifts for you. Go to debbie-inger.com slash gift and you can learn how to become way more visible than you are right now. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. So today's show, my guest is Sarah Breskman Cosme, the best-selling author of A Hypnotist Journey to Atlantis, A Hypnotist Journey to the Secrets of the Sphinx, and A Hypnotist Journey from the trail to the star people. Sarah is a master hypnotist, a level three practitioner of Dolores Cannon's QHHT, also a student of Brian Weiss, with a passion to reveal hidden or undiscovered knowledge vital to the enlightenment of humanity. Sarah won the 2023 Dolores Cannon Award and continues to speak about her work worldwide. Sarah's work is now featured internationally on places such as Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, Coast to Coast AM, and Gaia TV. If you would like to learn more about her, go to theholistichypnotist.com. And with that, I welcome Sarah to the Dare to Dream show. It's so great to have you back. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You are a busy, busy bee, and I definitely feel like you have a star, like you have Dolores or somebody looking after you who sees the importance of your work. I do, because I've been watching your star rising and rising. It is so lovely, like you're so deserving of it. And congrats on your latest book, The Thank Hypnotist you. Journey, The Trail to the Star People. So how for you was putting this book together, writing the book and getting it out into the world. How has it changed you? How has it challenged? Well, the thing is, you know, so many people tell me that the book has helped them so much, but the thing is that I don't feel as if I really wrote the book. When you read the book, you see, I'm not really the writer. I'm just the facilitator. And I know all these amazing things are happening for me, but there's nothing really special about me. I'm literally just a messenger. And it feels like people or higher level beings use my clients when they're deep under hypnosis as sort of like a radio. And they come through with all this amazing, profound, life-changing information. And it's so important for me to share it, they say, because people are looking for this information. So that's why I'm so passionate about sharing it. But I mean, my life is so different now all the belief systems that I used to have now, because I do this work almost every day. I mean, I just feel like if people even knew maybe a quarter or even less than that of the information that I receive on a daily basis, I bet they would be so much less worried about things, less stressed out. I bet they would even learn how they could actually take control of their lives and heal themselves. So 
I mean, I feel really lucky that I have access to this information on a daily basis because I bring my clients deep under hypnosis and the goal of these sessions is to access their higher self. And when I do that, I can find out anything. And it's always so exciting for me. What am I going to find out next? What do they want to share with me next? Because they are the ones that are writing these books. It's, it's not me. As much credit as I'd love to take <laughs> for the books, it's not me. It's this higher consciousness that ultimately has an agenda. So it's really changed my life to just be a part of this experience, even though I feel as if I'm just sort of on the on a ride with them. And just like the facilitator, it's just such an exciting, an exciting experience to be speaking all over the world and invited to, you know, come on all these shows and just be able to share this information in order to help people. It's really exciting. Oh, it's muted. We have some work going on here also. So I'm just muting. I'll, um, yeah, I want to follow the thread of something you said that I found very interesting and exciting, which was, if only people knew what I heard, they'd be so much less anxious, so much less worried. So what don't we know? Oh my gosh. Yeah, just give us a few tips that would be really surprising to learn that we're just unconscious about. Well, one thing that is so shocking and surprising is so many of my clients under hypnosis will remember that they were actually helped by a being that wasn't physical. Like I can't tell, maybe, maybe everyone has at least one experience and they don't even realize this. One of my clients was walking through forests, got lost and happened to come across a stranger that led them out. And they found out later that stranger wasn't a real person. Someone will be in the hospital. All of a sudden, this doctor comes in, knows how to perform this specialized surgery that one day, and no one can find access to him after that. People have no idea just how much help they have on the other side that can actually manifest them physically. And one time, even I had a client who was um, trying to escape from these men that were chasing her. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, she felt sleepy. She, she, the next thing she knew, she was a low, she was back on a road driving home, totally safe. And when she was under hypnosis, she realized that her team put her to sleep, moved her car to a safe location. I mean, that's when it's not your time to go. It's oh, not your time to go. And we have so much help and we're here for very specific reasons. You know, also, not just that, we really are here on a on a really important mission. We are like this huge experiment, so to speak. Like, really, you can't do anything wrong. You're not to get too deep too fast, but you can't screw it up. Mm -hmm. You're learning Everybody else is learning from you. You have a part of you that's never fully physically incarnated. There's a part of you that's always on the other side. You know, so many times when my clients are deep under hypnosis, they realize that they are still with their loved ones who have passed away. They never really leave them. You are sort of like um, creating this reality through the filters of your own belief system and mind. You literally have that much power to create anything that you want. Although manifestation might take a little while, whatever you want is also searching for you, so to speak. I mean, these are just some of the things that I've learned. I mean, just, I guess the, the most important thing is just that you can't do this wrong. I mean, I hear so many people say, oh, I need to do this. I should do this. Blah, 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 blah. You don't have to do anything and you will have a perfect experience. Mm -hmm. Just that experience alone will be enough to teach you so many things. I mean, you have so many countless times to come and keep experiencing different realms, different lifetimes, whatever. You just really can't get this wrong. There's no, there's no like time limit. It's not like time's up. You know, you have so many chances. Mm, I feel myself calming down when I hear you say that. That's wonderful. There's nothing needed. And I also really relate to you about this duality that you're living 
which is part scribe and part voice to the masses. So yeah. one aspect of you is the conduit through which these clients and incredible beings can come through so you can start telling stories. Yes. And then the other part of you is the visible one, is the one yeah. that is getting up and traveling the, the world and doing sacred retreats and going <laughs> to all these conferences and TV shows and so forth. And it's a it's a very interesting to walk that path, but it's very needed. I think it's very needed to be that person to create a bridge for these messages. So it's so fun. <laughs> it really is. It's it's a, like a great experience for me, not only to learn all these things, but to be able to share it because a lot of people couldn't share these things back in the day. It was too unacceptable. And now we've hit a point where things are becoming acceptable. So it's a really exciting time. 100%. I've been having so many conversations with, with people recently, you know, really detailed about extraterrestrials and when they're actually coming, open contact and so forth. And I was just speaking to Lee Carroll, Cryon, the other day, and he was, he said, Debbie, 30, 30 years ago, we couldn't have had this conversation. And it's really true. It's amazing. So here we are. And I want to dive a bit into a little bit of a trailer for your book, if you will. And your book promo starts with this quote, they call me Enawaya, the voice said through less. I am the one who contacted you. I've been watching you because you needed to gain our trust first. You have proven yourself ready. And so now I'm ready. I'm ready to tell our story. So Sarah, who is Anawaya? And what is the story that they needed to tell? Anawaya was a Cherokee Native American who walked the Trail of Tears or the forced relocation of the Native Americans in the Southeastern Hemisphere. And Anawaya, when he said that, what was happening was I had um, scheduled a hypnosis session with a woman named Les. So Les is like a 30 year old Caucasian woman very like friendly, bubbly. And um, we decided to do a session because of some random <laughs> experiment that I was doing. I was trying to use this extraterrestrial manifestation <laughs> technique that they had been, you know, telling one of my clients about. So I really wanted to try to, to do this. What they, what they were telling my client was to um, focus on a really strong, positive emotion. And whenever a human experiences a really positive emotion, it automatically opens up portals. And then when it opens up portals, if you can kind of visualize what it is you want to bring towards your life, you can manipulate the energy and matter around you. So I was like, gonna, I tried it. So I wanted to try it. So I just focused on gratitude because that's the easiest way to, you know, feel really good. And then I imagined the portal. And then I said, to the universe okay i want my next subject because i'm so excited to see what the universe is going to share with me next what are you guys going to share mm -hmm. with me next and that's when my phone pinged and it was this woman named bless and she said she had this weird feeling to reach out to me at that very moment but i knew as soon as she said that there's no coincidences <laughs> so i put her deep under hypnosis she agreed to try to see what happens have a session with me she had no idea what was going to happen I put her deep under hypnosis and that's when right away Anna Wyatt came through her kind of like using her as a radio so he was able to what he said and he claimed to be he claimed to be very much alive he claimed that he was a parallel version of her but he could he had perfected this type of meditation through multiple lifetimes. And what he would do is he would make himself very still and focus his consciousness into a future a version of himself where he could share information like, like a phone call through her to me. And it was really wild because he kept like, I felt like he was like my best friend at the end of the uh, putting this book together. But he had said that he had been watching me, which made me a little nervous. 
apparently I did something right. <laughs> I wasn't sure, but it was really honestly just a little bit shocking and very exciting at the same time because I knew that I had whatever next story they wanted to send me. Mm. Well, I want to, for anyone who doesn't know this part of history, I think it's very important. It's certainly very heartbreaking, but there is something called the Trail of Tears in the United States history. And it was literally an ethnic cleansing. It was this forced displacement of a, at least 60,000 people between the 1830s and the 1850s. And this was by the United States government, by the way. So what happened was white people wanted to make their fortunes by growing cotton. And so they resorted to violence. They stole the land. They stole livestock. They burned. They looted houses. They killed. Um, there was mass murder. They squatted on land that didn't even belong to them. And so at the beginning of the 1830s, about 125,000 Native Americans who lived on these acres of land in Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina, Florida, land that their ancestors had occupied and cultivated for generations. Well, by the end of this trail of tears, there was very little, if any, natives who still live there and basically the white people had taken over it. The federal government had forced them to leave their homelands and to walk hundreds of miles to a place designated called Indian Territory across the Mississippi River. And it was deadly. It was difficult because they were often walking in snow and terrible conditions. So how did... Sarah, how did Anawaya describe this trail of tears? Was he actually on it? Was his family on it? Yes, he shared, and it was so difficult to listen to. In the beginning, it was just so hard. I, I have never cried during a session. I can hold myself together, but I couldn't keep it together. I mean, it was nothing like anything I had ever heard before. It was genocide. It was so terrible. And so he said it was really important that he shares his firsthand perspective of what it was like to walk. And, you know, the, the very first like, like death that he described was so shocking to him and then everybody else that he was with, that it was just like, they couldn't, they couldn't even believe it in the beginning. And then it just got worse and worse and worse. But what I, what the reason why Anawaya wanted to share this information was there were a lot of reasons, but one was because he kept saying that there's so many of us that carry this trauma with us. And it doesn't matter what color your skin is right now, because so many people have this trauma and they, they're, you know, reincarnated. They know they've been on, you know, they know they have connections to this in whatever ways that they do. And there's so much trauma to account for that. This was one way that he thought would be best to release this trauma because when I asked him, and it was so interesting to me, so I started to get a little angry, honestly, learning about what the white man did. And when I asked him, why did the white man do this? What happened? Like, why did the white man do, do this? His, his answer was really surprising to me. He said, they understood, not all of them. They never said it was okay, but they understood that it wasn't the white man they were fighting. And he said, and it was so interesting. He said the white man was were some of the earliest victims of this negative energy that asserted itself to the planet. And they knew that they had they had understandings of this. They were very connected with the star people. And they understood that the white man were some of the earliest victims of this negative energy. And Anna Wyatt claimed the white man's culture was stolen from them. It wasn't like they forgot. It was stolen from them so long ago, and they forgot that they even had a culture, but they used to be pagans. They used to have like a, um, a culture that was very um, 
you know, nature based, like every other indigenous culture, they used to like have magical beliefs, they used to understand the power of nature, and magic and the other realms, but it was taken from them so long ago that they don't even have a culture. So Anna Wyatt said many of them understood that they were not fighting the white man. And it kind of brought things sort of into perspective to me to really see why one of the reasons why I wanted to share this was that we are all in this together. And what he said was that if you look at the sacred symbols, and again, he never said this is okay, but if you look at the sacred symbols, the four corner symbol, Anawaya was saying, represented the symbol that we all spread out in order to eventually circle back and come back together, back to one meeting point where we would have gained so much about our separation and about ourselves when we finally come back together. And he said, that's what we are eventually doing. We are in alignment with this coming back of sorts, this coming back together so that we all had to kind of like separate ourselves, do all kinds of crazy things. Then when we come back, we come back greater because we have so much more awareness in this coming back. And that's what we're basically doing. We're reuniting with our soul family, so to speak, and understanding that we're, we really are all in this together. You mentioned, um, so less this client yeah. who has this motivation to pick up the phone and call you, how was she with all of this when, when she started to learn what was coming out of her? How did she feel? Did it change her? Les was a little, well, Les was shocked in the beginning because she wasn't really expecting this to happen, but she knew that she had on, on her mom's side of the family, she had some Cherokee in her. So she was very interested to understand more about her, you know, history or family's history. Um, she was very much removed from that information. She didn't grow up knowing about it. So she was very curious, but she also had this experience where I could tell, and I love it when my clients are coming out of a session because she had this feeling or this look about her where she kind of knew that she was so much greater than the surface level person that you call less. Like there are so many more aspects to her and all she did was go into herself and look into herself and you know there's like a world in there how many sessions did you do with her um a lot we worked on this project a lot um probably like close to 20 to make wow. sure and why didn't have anything else he wanted to say because I wanted to make sure I got his story correctly. And there were times when I was doing some things wrong and I was working actually with my, all kinds of weird, weird phenomenon was happening <laughs> when I was working on this book, but I was working with my mom. I would send her like what I would transcribe and she would look over it and then send it back to me. If I was, if I missed a part or if I didn't transcribe something, you know, like put it, <laughs> it would erase. <laughs> I'd have to go do it again. And then <laughs> all kinds of weird things, all kinds of weird things were happening. When I was working on the trail part, that was the hardest part. I was just trying to, because I don't um, get one of those transcribing apps. I want to hear what the person said. So I was transcribing word for word what wow. Anna Wyatt said about the trail. And I noticed that like my eyelashes were wet <laughs> on the left side. And I thought, this is so weird. So I went outside to walk my dog and still they were like wet, like runny. And I looked in the mirror and I had a trail of tears going down my face. <laughs> I mean, weird, weird things like that, you know? So I knew I was being watched and I knew I was being helped basically, mm -hmm. but I also did not want to get it wrong. <laughs> hundred percent. Yes. I mean, that's, it's a big honor, but it's a big responsibility that you are telling somebody's story from history, right? right. That they trust, they've been watching you enough to trust you to come through 
and right. that they know you're going to do a good job. So yes, it's, I understand. I, I well, would my job's that. easy. I basically just transcribe it, but I never, sometimes I don't know where, what part goes with why, where, what, you know, so that's, you know, all I have to do really. It's easy. That and book, was it that book Anna Waya? Was it Anna Waya who actually brought up star people to you? Because I'd love to explore that a little bit. I know that for sure. I know that uh -huh. since the beginning of indigenous people and uh, shamanism actually started 2.6 million years ago. I mean, pff, right? This is Paleolithic times. So what did you learn about this? Certainly for the Cherokees or for any of the Native Americans that you learned about? Well, it was interesting because Anawaya was recounting his life and he started from the beginning and he told me about when, after his family was um, murdered, mm -hmm. he went into the forest and then eventually went into a different tribe and he met this woman that he completely fell head over heels with. He was so in love with her. It was so cute. But he, it, the way we got into the whole star people conversation was that he told me that he was surprised that she knew the same stories that he knew because they were so far away from each other. Although some of their stories were a little different and some of their traditions were a little bit different, but he thought it was really interesting that she knew a lot of the same like origin stories, a lot of the same star people stories that he did and he had never met another tribe when he was growing up so he didn't know how did they have access to the same information and it was really interesting when he was describing how they would communicate with them they would kind of use their drums and create this kind of like a meditation and so basically they would clear their mind and that's something i hear all the time by the higher selves if you want to want to really if you do want more contact mm -hmm. to learn how to clear your mind because the communication is telepathic. Mm -hmm. So they would clear their mind in this way and the with the drumming and everything. And then the images or the, the beings would actually show up in their mind's eye and they would all see the same beings. But the more they would focus on it, it wasn't it wasn't just in their mind's eye. They would see them physically mm -hmm. and they would all describe like the same beings and they would get a lot of help from the star people. They knew a lot about the star people. And so it was really just interesting what a connection they had and the, all the stories and they understood so much about, you know, the star people and they had such a presence in their, in their life, you know, so yes. they, they knew yes. that they were the ones that actually gave them certain things and they knew that they had given them corn and then they, they had mm. different stories for, um, the different beings, but it really appeared that most of them, many of them had a lot of contact with the, um, Pleiadians okay. it really is, and Syrians, but most, a lot of the Pleiadians. But what I found so fascinating was when I was working on my Atlantis book and my Lemuria book, a hypnotist journey to Atlantis, I had my client while she was deep under hypnosis, see the symbol of Lemuria. Now Lemuria was a beautiful, like kind of a tribal society, very compassionate um, in the South Pacific. And that's a lot, that's very far from uh, the United States or where Anna Waya was located. But I had her draw the symbol and it was the four corner symbol. And I never thought, I never thought anything of it. Hmm. So when when I was working on this book, I started to understand, well, through these clients and through Anna Waya and through many other clients, that this symbol, the four corners symbol came from the Pleiadian, Pleiades. It came from the Pleiades, went to Lemuria, and then was a symbol in the Native American culture because a lot of the Native Americans and many other indigenous cultures were survivors from Lemuria. And so they took this and it was almost like a like a trail of this star knowledge and star symbol symbolism and information into their culture. So it's really interesting that it was all a clue to, in order to put our, you know, our origins together. But Can you describe when you say four corners, what does oh, that look like? Oh, okay. A circle and then a cross in it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what, um, and is this it, often what has the different animals in the corners or, because I've seen them with symbols. Right. 
Well, that one is the medicine wheel, I believe. But what I'm talking about is like a circle and then there's like a line and then another line. This is the symbol that Jen drew when she was drawing the symbol for Lemuria. It was just a very simple symbol, but it had a lot of meaning. And some of the meanings that the star people put in these sacred symbols are to like get us to just look at them and it downloads information because these sacred symbols are not just symbols at all. They're actually like keys, they're coded information. So there's, it's like a key that goes into a lock when you look at say like a crop crop circle or, or like a, the flower of life pattern, it unlocks information within your mind. And all you have to do is look at it. And a lot of this information will go straight into your subconscious. So when you're doing a session, you can pull it out almost like a hard drive. <laughs> but um, it was really interesting that these these Native Americans from Lemuria came into, um, you know, the Americas. And I thought that's pretty far away. Why the Americas? Well, a lot of them went to Mount Shasta. That was a big place that a lot of survivors from Lemuria went because it took them two months by their boats to get to Mount Shasta. And they had already been trying to colonize those areas. So they knew of this place, but they didn't go into the mountain right away. They eventually did explore and find this mountain. But when they went into the mountain, they remember finding this like room of calm energy. And basically in, in um, Mount Shasta, what makes it so unique, why a lot of people are drawn to it is because their civilizations leave an imprint. And many people have memories of living inside that mountain believe it or not definitely and all you have to do is go to mount shasta and you can regain part of your divine essence but but what was interesting was uh, these people traveled all over when they were surviving you know uh when they had survived lemuria and atlantis but i found it really interesting that they found their way into the native american culture and a lot of them had memories and information from Lemuria. Mm. Wow. What an incredible cycle that is cycle upon cycle oh. upon cycle of places and beings and destruction and karma and all of that. Amazing, amazing that you're, you're weaving this together like you are. And so we are, we're right here with you. Anawaya, his family is killed he goes into the forest, he finds this other tribe, they accept him, he falls madly in love with somebody. While they're having their conversation, they discover, wow, this is very interesting, but we have same experiences with star beings, Platons, Syrians, and yeah. others. And then comes this cross symbol. So very interesting. What, what happens to Anawaya after this? Does he, he flourish? Never- and he never went by names. Like he never called these places like Atlantis, Lemuria. When he was referring to them, he would call them the lands before. Mm-hmm. And then he would like work with less's vocabulary. So it took a little while, but I, you know, if we found out which ones it was and same with star people, they always called him star people or the seven sisters. He would call the Pleiades, the Pleiades, the seven sisters. After he fell madly in love with this woman, then he went to England. So he was to sign a, 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 a treaty there. And his memories was really like disgusting, <laughs> like what it smelled like. And it was really interesting. And what, then what um, was that? Wait, 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 what England smelled like was horrifying to him. Yeah. Lo, lo, yeah he just couldn't believe that people would dump their bathwater. He was mm. mostly shocked. And he said, thank goodness he he had was used to a canoe because mm-hmm. he had to go in a big boat. But he said he was mostly shocked that people didn't understand the use of the land. Like there was, he didn't know, and it was so surprising for him. He didn't know why anyone would put a barrier between themselves and the earth. Mm-hmm. Like, like, you know, like roads or anything, you know, where you don't step directly on the earth. He didn't understand that. And he didn't understand why people would ever not want to use trade, you know, because they were asking for money at places like that. So they really, 
it, it was it, interesting to go through his memories of this this as well and um you know I won't give it away his cute little love story so in love with her but um what was interesting was when they finally got to their new lands everything that these people had told them about and they lost most of their people by the time that they did finally get to these lands they were not fertile lands at all they had been told they were going to get to fertile lands the water made them sick because they weren't used to the water and so they were in a lot of pain and a lot of them were having stomach pain so they would drown themselves with alcohol so that they didn't feel the pain and the people in the neighboring towns you know, some of them felt bad for them. Others were kind of prejudiced. And so they, some of them developed a really unhealthy relationship with alcohol because there was just, it was so disappointing, mm. but they worked their way to kind of deal with it. And then another thing that was interesting is you never think about what it's like to be a survivor. Like there, when you survive something or you experience something like this, there's a time where you have to integrate it and you don't really know how to do that at first. So they really were in shock for a while when they first arrived on this land and then they were trying to find like a good source of water, try to acclimate themselves to it and rebuild from basically nothing. They had nothing. So, you know, it was interesting, but ultimately when Anna Wyatt ended his life, he, you know, he had, you know, he's always such a positive guy, <laughs> such a positive person that, you know, he gained a lot, but he, what was interesting too, is that Les, when she was younger and Les told me this after our first session, she said that it was so strange because she had an imaginary friend named Anna Waya when she was like a baby. <laughs> And you know, I found out that a lot of imaginary friends are actually past life versions of ourselves or like other be other uh, high level conscious beings. Like That's speaking. a very common story for children who say, yeah, when I was young, I had a playmate that I saw all the time. Right. I never conceived that there was a connection there. Yeah, she said his name was, she couldn't believe it. She was like, I had a. I had an um, imaginary friend. Well, she didn't remember what he looked like. She was pretty young, but she thought, wow, that wasn't an imaginary friend now, was it? She so was we searched scared. We searched for Anna Wyatt. It took us a while to try to find him because with the documentation, it was hard. But what really gave it away, Les did a genealogy, try to find out more about her, her roots. And it turns out, that Anawaya actually is related to her was her like I don't know how many greats great 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 grandfather somehow <laughs> so when she found out a little more about her roots we what happened was the way we really found him was Anawaya had drawn a picture of him and with memory so then we looked you know, tried to try to trace it back. And Anna White also knew um, the chief named Black Fox. So we were trying to look around that time period and we, we could find Black Fox. He was the first person that we found. And then we were trying to find any records of Anna Waya and it all matched up when we finally found him. So he was a real person, but mm -hmm. his name was changed. It wasn't Anna Waya. You won't really find his name is Anna Wyatt. His name was changed to Chief Billy Justice because it was easier for the white man to say. <laughs> so Les is drawing scenes, these pictures of scenes and of people mm -hmm. that she's describing, and you're verifying these pictures that were depicted. Yeah. And even with the name change, you were able factually to find yes. Anna Wyatt. Yeah, we could find him factually. It took a while, but we found him. Pretty sure, pretty sure, you know, it's always a possibility it's not him, but I really do think it is him with everything lining up, even down to the fact that his name was changed and he um, came from, you know, the Cherokee tribe and it's is related to less, like really distant, distant. <laughs> 
great grandmother. What so it makes you wonder, story. doesn't it? Are you the yeah. reincarnation of your relatives? You know, are you? Because you quite possibly could be. Isn't that a weird thought to think? Maybe I am my great, 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 great grand, you know, father or mother. Well, as long as they were fabulous, I'm really happy. <laughs> with it, you know, I don't yeah. need a relative or an ancestor who is <laughs> suffering that as you know, right. I, I'm coming back, but yeah, that's uh, incredibly powerful. I'm sure this woman's life is changed. How beautiful she's yeah. only 30 uh, to have something remarkable like this happen. Actually, it's, she did orchestra. orchestra. Yeah, actually she did have a lot of healing. And so she, when we first met, she was suffering from a lot of kidney conditions and those cleared up during the sessions because she was holding a lot of anger in her kidneys that she wasn't even aware of. It was subconscious anger. So a lot of that had to do with um, Anna Waya's memories of this one man who just treated him so badly that Anna Waya kept this anger towards this one man, even though he really, really tried to forgive this one man who just like really had it out for Anna Waya. Like, because Anna Waya said he understood and why I understood that this man, and he called him the man with a mustache, saw himself in Anawaya. And so he would, they were so similar. Both of their families had been, I don't know if um, the man with the mustache family was murdered too, but they both lost their family at early ages. They're both right around the same age. They're, you know, they had like um, similar, like, you know, um, just thing, things about them were similar. So Anna Wise said he could tell the man with the mustache just saw himself in him and he just couldn't handle it. He just had to just target Anna Waya. And so that was, you know, really tough for him. And even less, it had nightmares of this strange man with a mustache. So it all kind of came together. So it's interesting. Do we hold like genetic ancestral trauma that we aren't even aware of like how much of our trauma is in our subconscious that when you become aware of it you can release you know absolutely i think that's why ancestral trauma work is so huge and i think that's why i know i've done tons of it myself and every time i'm working with a healer and this comes up they always give me the idea that my ancestors are surrounding me like, thank you. Thank you for doing this work. Thanks for taking this on. Clearing, cleaning, clearing, cleaning. And then, yeah. you know, even going forward, whatever of myself I leave, you know, the better gets taken forward for all our lives, for our bloodlines and lineage and all of it. It's, it's super important because much like what you said, you know, these things leave an imprint. It yeah. leaves imprints on places, on other people, on ourselves. And, and so it's really beautiful, really beautiful to feel too. this. I, oh. I want to ask you in the book, there's this quote, and I want to ask you what it means. And that's, you've all forgotten that you incarnated to fulfill a long ago promise made to yourself, the promise of liberation. What was meant by that? Oh my gosh. So apparently we've all promised ourselves that we would come in to really fully liberate ourselves, to become free of the shackles that we have put on ourselves, to kind of go through this great awakening process. It's almost like we are in alignment right now and we've all promised ourselves this alignment. We've all promised ourselves this golden age that we've all like put these crazy shackles on ourselves We've all gone through these horrific experiences, but now we're really ready to throw them away and walk into this golden age. Everything is in alignment with this awakening of our consciousness. This is foretold in so many ancient cultures, you know, this cycle that we do over and over again. And now we're coming back into this golden age where we overthrow our oppressors. But ultimately, when humanity overthrows their oppressors, they're really overthrowing an aspect of themselves that was oppressing themselves. It's all very like, it's all connected. So, you know, as we do the inner work on ourselves, it reflects in our outer reality. And we really are entering this time where we really become liberated and we owe it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
You remind me of two things. The first is Puma Freddy. Puma Freddy is a very famous worldwide renowned shaman, was on this show. And he told a story when he was younger. His grandfather, Don Maximo, they're from Peru, from an old Inca ancestry tribe. And he felt so much anger towards the conquistadors that the Spaniards could have done this to his people. Same, basically, ethnic cleansing. And his grandfather said, come, you know, come grandson, let me take you on a little journey. And they had these ways of time traveling and doing things in other realms and dimensions, extraordinary. And so his grandfather took him back in time to actually see the Spaniards, see the conquistadors. And what Puma Freddy saw was himself as a conquistador. <laughs> And in that moment, all this rage he'd been carrying, all this anger, you know, on behalf of his people collectively, it completely dropped. It ameliorated, it was done, and it was gone and neutralized. And he came back a healed man, very peaceful, realizing, I am that, I am that, I am everything, truly, I am everything. And of course, you and I have had conversations. The first thing I said is, oh, my word, like, as a Jewish woman, I wonder, um, you know, that's almost unthinkable to consider ever right. Nazis or anything like that. But I also, my heart, my my healed heart loves the idea of leveling the playing field that we are all, rather, we are not separate. And I think this is a very powerful notion to understand and karmically how we can heal in the next life in the next life. I really do believe just what you said. I really do believe so. I think it is so healing. And I think it's healing for people when they really can put themselves into the shoes of others and understand where they're coming from, like what happened to that man when he saw that he was them. Because really, we are all one and we all play different roles. And even the people that are the meanest to you, you know, you, you'd be surprised they have a role of being mean to you so that it forces growth in some other way. There's mm -hmm. a reason for it because we are in this dualistic realm. We need that in order to grow. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of these more really advanced beings that come through my clients, when I ask who's the most advanced being in the universe, because I've asked that, mm -hmm. you know what they say? Mm -hmm. The awakened human. And so really? it's really, yeah, like Shiva. Like, um, because what they say is unlike any other being in the universe, the human potential is actually unlimited. So those make them the biggest, not only the biggest threat, but the most, if you want to say advanced, but the most powerful because they have unlimited potential. There is no limit. It's only the limits that they put on themselves. So it's really interesting that we have access to this, like each person has access to this unlimited potential, but we have no idea like how to use it doesn't feel that way. You walk outside your door and like, you know, you have a flat tire and you're like, how do I have that? But it's like learning to understand yourself better and learning to understand that you are source itself, which is basically the understanding that we are all doing as a collective, because the more we understand just how powerful and how much we are actually source the more we start to raise our consciousness because other advanced beings, like even beings from the Pleiades, when I've asked them, okay, so how did you guys all collectively, you know, advance yourself? They said as a collective, and it took them a millennia, but as a collective, they came to fully understand that they were source. So we're still working this out. We're still like low down on our belief system. Basically that's the secret. If you can collectively understand that you are source or God, whatever you want to call it, the more you start to advance and the more you as a collective will experience, you know, higher levels of vibration and higher levels of mastery, basically. Wow. Wow. That's um, sort of throwing down the gauntlets of humanity to up level a little bit. I love this. You know, it's all at your fingertips. I want to mention you and I, a little plug for both of us, we're both oh. speaking 
at the UFOlogy World Congress event, December 1st through 3rd. We'll both be in Mexico City. Very excited about that. And I'm speaking about UFOs and shamans. So, you know, your this whole conversation for me is so timely because I just have felt this calling about this subject and that there's a very strong connection that the native, and I, when I say shamans, I am including Native Americans. I'm including the shamans in Siberia, all over the world, China, Japan, et cetera, that these very dismissed people actually have always known. They have known about the connection to the earth, to the sacred mountains, the apus, to the sky, to the, the animals, the spirits, the ancestors, the star beings. They are the ones we ultimately really want to become because in becoming more like them, we are healing. Like I feel a very strong sense of being an ambassador for this message and information right now. So I'm so grateful for your portion in this. So just speak to that first. Well, it's so important that work that you're doing, because as the consciousness of, you know, as, as our consciousness, humanity's consciousness is rising, and you can see it with our level of awareness and understanding, so is the consciousness of the earth. The consciousness of the earth is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And humanity, for a majority of humanity, there's a disconnect. We don't know how to use not only the subtle layers of energy, we don't know how to communicate with nature where we're like indigenous cultures and, and will tell you that you have to develop a relationship with nature around you. And that relationship is important. And as we really go into this more of a golden age or just, you know, even step, take the first couple steps into this golden age, a lot of the old program is, is going to start to recede. And then everyone will be searching for the ancient ways. Mm -hmm. They're going to be trying to revert back to them. And many people are not going to know what the ancient ways are. So people like you that are bringing that information out, you know, people like Anna Waya or, you know, all these people that are bringing that information out, that information will be very needed because everyone's going to need the ancient ways. What are the ancient ways? We're going to need them <laughs> because the time will be right to use them again. Yes. And what's beautiful about, I don't know all the ancient ways. I know the practices I know that are shamanic, but I can say, what, and even before I studied, I worked with a shaman who, of course, you know, no accident, as you like to say, lives <laughs> in my town from Peru. <laughs> and I worked with her for eight months. And she would always say before the beginning of the session, this is going to seem so easy, but it is very powerful. And she was exactly correct. It was this gentle, always a gentle experience, profound in results. So I feel like that's what you're saying. These ancient practices are so important. They teach us all the things you just mentioned. And then also the inner work, right? The healing with yeah. the inner work. You have to develop relationship with all these aspects plus ourselves to right. truly heal. Yeah, totally. And, and it's funny because I really wanted to be in the know. I wanted the latest, you know, the best energy device, you know, because there's so many on the market. So I've asked the higher self, I want to know the best because I'm going to go out and buy it. And they said, oh, well, you know, if you look at the most effective energy device that will really help you, it's putting your bare feet on the earth. Ah, <laughs> that's beautiful. So, <laughs> I was so upset. It's like I wanted to pay for it or or mm -hmm. something, you know, but they said 15 minutes a day will change any person's life. Yeah. So it's like 15 minutes a day. That's it. That's it. That's the I, best device. Sarah, I do it every single morning. Every morning I get up and at some point, maybe before or after coffee, but I get out there and I put my feet in the grass. I sit in a chair with my feet in the grass and I do a whole shamanic practice. And this, this grounding work is amazing. I have a real relationship, like a real moving, loving relationship with mother earth. Aww. And before I did this, I would have never even understood those words. They would have been, oh, I would have so gotten it like a metaphysician, but not in the position I'm in. But she is so powerful and so resilient. And 
she's going to be okay no matter what we do, but of course. she's waiting for us to catch up. And I love what you're saying. I love that you received that information because it's true. You can put your feet on the ground, envision roots growing out deeply into the earth. You know, I ask her questions. I tell her things that are going on. I let, you know, I feel like it's symbiotic, the feeding, if you will, the energy Definitely. that goes back and forth. And I always say you're the greatest mother who ever lived. And I'm so grateful you're my mother. I'm so lucky to have this experience. It's very healing. Oh, that's so beautiful. I mean, there's a lot of light frequency hitting the planet right now. And not yeah. only can you absorb that higher light frequency that's pumping through the, the inner earth plane, but also just by, you know, doing that beautiful practice that you do, but receiving some light codes through your unfiltered eyes, because I never knew that this was an issue for people until I had a client that couldn't lose weight because their higher self said they don't go outside without their contacts. I didn't know that that was important. The higher self said that it really helps to get a little bit, like a little bit of unfiltered light, because what happens is there's a portal within our sun. And right now it's be the there's high frequency light being broadcast through the portal of the sun. It goes through our unfiltered eyes into our pineal gland. And then it's like downloading information into us. Mm. So there's all these beautiful pra practices that are natural. But even like that beautiful practice that you do when you really connect with the earth. If, if you've done that for a little while, you notice that things start to grow in your area that are cures if you're ever oh. sick. Like, and it'll be total totally relevant to you because it's like kind of reciprocating in your relationship with it so the earth will respond by not only sending you information through animals that you might see while you're doing that beautiful grounding process but also you might even have weeds that will actually if you google them be remedies to whatever kind of issue you have in your body Oh, that's so interesting. I'm actually going to do that. We have this great thing. This is my iPhone, right? We So we have these iPhones. You can actually take a picture now and click on info and it will tell you the plant or the tree, or I'm going to try it on weeds and see yeah, if it, do it gives us the genus <laughs> of weed and the information. That is so cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Once you develop that relationship like you're doing, then the relation, then the um, environment that you're in responds and it develops a relationship back. So Sarah, what are you going to be talking about? What can we look forward to at the UFOlogy World Congress event for your presentation? So I have my first book, A Hypnotist's Journey to Atlantis in Spanish. And I'm going to be presenting about whether or not you my, my presentation is called, Do You Remember Atlantis? So I'm going to talk a lot about Atlantis and Lemuria and see if some of these slides that I have and these memories that people have can possibly trigger people's memories themselves and see if they um, also notice little telltale signs or clues that they do have memories and what they can do about it. Um. 13 and, questions. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. And I'll be with you at Conscious Life Expo also, which I'm so excited. I'm going to go deeper into this topic with Anna Waya and talk a lot about this book, A Hypnotist's Journey from the Trail to the Star People. And I'm going to go really deep into a lot of the information from the star people and then the um, indigenous culture's wisdom. Well, that's wonderful because I know in your book, um, and where can people buy it? So you can buy it off my website at theholistichypnotist.com or go to Amazon. It's on Amazon and Audible. All three books are on Audible as well. All your books are there. I know it got amazing reviews. People wrote like really great reviews, which is exciting. And so again, you're referring at Conscious Life Expo in February, you're going to be going deeper into Anawaya. And I just want to say, because it's like, oh, cliffhanger stuff. He talks about lighting, these secret of the ancients. He talks about powerful willingness to survive. Wow. Yes. And shocking history of our planet, 
origins of us all from the stars. And I think that's going to be an amazing presentation, like a, a great time to be presenting this. What's next for you, Sarah? Like you have, let me start with this because you, you and I follow each other. I know you were just in Egypt. Um, are these retreats, these sacred experiences, what's up for you? How is that going? How is Egypt? How is so, that? When I went to Egypt a while ago for the first time in 2018, and I thought, you know, this is a, a fantastic trip. But I really wanted to go deeper into my own feelings when I was there. I wanted to really experience these places and like get a chance to meditate in these places. Well, throughout the years and through, you know, writing my different books, I've learned a lot about Egypt. And so what people don't understand is that each person holds their own key to unlocking the information in Egypt. It's not something else. When you go to Egypt, you'll see signs and symbols everywhere, and they're pointing you in some direction, but you know what they're pointing to? They're pointing to you, and they'll show you different signs, like you can access it, you know, through this pineal gland. They're talking about you. You are the key. When you go to Egypt, you are the key, and the different, um, different sacred sites, there are light codes that emanate up off about a foot and a half off the ground and they work with your own um, crown chakra and your pineal gland and so you are the key when you go to different places you get information that is important for you so part of the things that I do when I do take a tour to Egypt is I allow people to have this time the sacred time for themselves and I run I uh not only share what I've learned in these places, but I let them do deep meditations in these places so they can get the information and the healing for themselves. And of course, I've asked so many higher selves, what are the best things to do in these different places? Because I want to do the best, you know, I want to access stuff. And so I've learned over the years what to do in these different places. So I do two tours a year, but they sell out very fast. Um, we're about to open the one for September, probably like the beginning of November or whatever, we'll open that tour. And because my sessions book up so fast, I started hosting these workshops and those are amazing. So I have like three day workshops where people can come and I do past life regressions and deep inner healing meditations. And then these people have become like a family with one another. And some even moved in and started living together. So it's really an amazing experience to facilitate. I'm almost done my fourth book, which I don't really, people ask me, how do I write these books? Well, you have to understand I'm the scribe. So my job is really easy. <laughs> I mean, Anna Why wrote his book in less than a year and I'm a busy mom of three. So there's no way I could write a book like that. So I'm just literally the scribe that's transcribing it. I'm basically almost done the fourth book and that should be out in like probably a few months. Um, I don't know when this comes out, but I'm speaking at Disclosure Fest, Stairway to the Stars, it, uh, November 10th. And I'm going to be doing a live regression in front of the whole audience there. I'm going to put someone deep under hypnosis, access their higher consciousness. Once I gain access, I'll open it up to the audience for questions so they can ask whatever they want. <laughs> wow. So, whoa, that's a lot uh, <laughs> predicated on the fact that this is going to work. Do you know who the person's going to be, who you're going to put under? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I've already put her under, so I know okay. she's. So you know easy. she's a, a good yeah. client. Okay. <laughs> so this is going to be videotaped. I hope that's phenomenal. It is. Yes, it's all videotaped, and I'll be speaking, um, also about what I've learned through ex so many extraterrestrials that have told mm -hmm. me about how we can become superhuman. So I love excited. that. Oh my God. That's a future conversation. Extraterrestrials and superhumans done girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to talk about that, please. So thank you. Those are a lot of dreams. I clearly you're still massively daring to dream and allowing your excitement to just pull you forward into these amazing projects. And thank you for the gorgeous work you do and all your books and um, I can't wait to see you in December. 
Me too. This is going to be so fun. I can't wait. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do too. My pleasure. And congrats on the new book. Folks, if you'd like to find out more about her, go to theholistichypnotist.com and you can get Sarah's books and find her events and her sessions there. And I end today's show with this quote from Dolores Cannon. Love is the most powerful force in the world. If people tell you that the opposite of love is fear, it is not so. Love just is. Love has no opposite. Remember that, dear one. Love has no opposite. Love just is. It is the answer to everything. Everything. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream podcast. Next week on the show, I am featuring the amazing JJ and Desiree Hertak, the brilliant husband and wife team who are the founders of the Academy for Future Science and authors of The Keys of Enoch. Thanks for joining us today on Dare to Dream.